All right, hi folks. Welcome to the Bears Gym. Uh, got a little Bible study here for you today. I got Boris here, my mascot. I don't know if you can uh, be able to see him, but he's gonna keep us company. Uh, so don't be alarmed to see a big furry tail swinging by us, a little St. Bernard here to keep me company. So uh, he's probably going to get a little bit frisky because he thinks this is uh, go for a walk time or some kind of excitement for him, maybe treats. But it's not. you got to be a good boy. And we got a little Bible study to do here. So you can sniff around the gym and uh, find a nice place to lay down. But uh, Otherwise, we're doing Matthew 24 today. Uh, this is going to be a pretty long study. And uh, I should probably monitor my time so that uh, we can kind of expedite this so we don't spend over an hour on Matthew 24 but it is a pretty heavy chapter uh, it's a fairly long chapter it's going to deal with the uh, end times and uh, so there's a lot of very good doctrine uh, when Jesus is coming uh, to rule over the earth um, a little bit of insight into uh, judgment upon the earth. Um, anyway, I guess the best thing to do is just crack right into it. And in, uh, Matthew 24, uh, reading from the King James Version. Here we go. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. During that time, the temple uh, buildings uh, were all intact. If you go to Jerusalem today, uh, you will see a lot of ruins. As far as the Temple Mount area, the, the temple that was uh, at this time Herod's temple um, for the Jews, um, where uh, the priests offered the sacrifices and so forth. Um, at this point in time, uh, also, this was uh, uh, prior to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, they had the uh, Ark of the Covenant uh, in there, um, we believe. Um, they had the uh, veil of the temple, was torn in two. Uh, when his uh, crucifixion happened, and they had that veil up to hide the Ark of the Covenant. And so at this point in time, we believe, um, most good uh, theologians believe that uh, the Ark of the Covenant was present, at least at this point in time, and the priests had the, the regular rituals and the sacrifices and so forth. And uh, later on, all of a sudden, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. Um, was something very um, heavenly and supernatural involved, where God came and whoop, took the Ark of the Covenant off, off of the earth and out of the uh, presence of the Jewish peoples in the temple? Because uh, later on, then, the uh, temple was then again destroyed. Um, but we don't really know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, there's uh, a little insight in the Revelation that may indicate the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. Very possibly, don't, don't quote me on it because I don't know. I'm not in heaven yet. All right, so... Um, but you know there, there was there's been various uh, storylines. They even made a movie, you know, about the finding of the Ark of the Covenant and so forth. And uh, those were all very cool. And uh, and and uh, but the reality is we really don't know where it's at. Anyway, so the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, all that is all pretty much in place, and that's kind of the the setting uh, for this chapter. And the, the disciples are about to question. Jesus about what's about to happen and they say Lord look at these beautiful beautiful buildings 
This is Jesus' response to the disciples. Jesus said unto them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that's very interesting because the stones of the temple were humongous and heavy. Why would every stone, unless there was a great earthquake, be thrown down? So that it's kind of each and every stone is thrown down, what he just said. Um, there will not be one stone upon another. That means something very traumatic would have had to have happened. A major earthquake or a man-made pull-apart stone by stone, which is probably what the Romans did uh, when they conquered a Jerusalem over because of the rebellion and so forth and destroyed the temple. Some believe they set the temple on fire and uh, the gold um, that was in the temples weaved through the rocks and they pulled the rocks apart to get the gold out of it. Or it could be that it was just from sheer hatred of the temple, you know, um, that, you know, we ain't going to let one stone stand just for the sheer, we're not going to let them ever, ever, like they have before in the past, come back, rebuild this temple, and establish their kingdom here in Jerusalem. That whoever that would have been uh, did not want that. But in either case, Jesus said, there, there will not be one stone upon another. So they kind of probably deflated them of thinking, wow, what grandiose, how beautiful these buildings are. And uh, but Jesus said, no, no, this, this will pass away. So don't get your heart set on it. And that's kind of the point. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? We're going to move into the end times here rather quickly. Um, most in uh, good standard orthodox uh, Christians believe there will be a, a surprise catching away of the body of Christ, those that are ready and uh, abiding in Jesus Christ, abiding in the light, walking with him, that he will come and make a ap very quick appearance and catch the body of Christ off of this earth. Then there will be a tribulation uh, period uh, upon this earth where uh, Israel uh, will have to endure uh, much of the tribulations, much of the wars of the nations, where we'll see Ezekiel kind of come to play, uh, where the nations are coming against uh, uh, the nation of Israel, as Ezekiel explains uh, in, in a very uh, powerful, powerful fashion, and the Lord intervenes and so forth. And that happens during the, that tribulation kind of time. Um, after the, that tribulation time, uh, somewhere around in there, the beast uh, makes himself known, sets himself up in yet again a rebuilt temple that he rebuilds, uh, finances probably, uh, sets himself up as, well, I am your Messiah, you will worship me. He kind of sets himself up there in Jerusalem. And... Uh, after then, we have that period, then uh, the beast kind of assumes control of the earth, kind of takes over the nations and so forth. Uh, then at the end of that, the Lord will come and judge uh, the beast and the false prophet and Satan. And um, the beast and the false prophet will be cast uh, into the lake of fire, which is everlasting, and Satan will be thrown into Hades for a thousand years. And there will be a thousand years of peace on the earth that the Lord uh, establishes. Um, uh, and there will be certain judgments and certain things that people will have to keep, the certain uh, festivals and so forth. Uh, at the end of that time, there will be yet another war where Satan will be released from um, Hades and once again deceive the nations that were left on the earth 
uh, for one last and final battle. And uh, so we, we're going to see where some of this kind of deals with this slightly with a little bit of insight, but not a complete insight. And that's kind of the way God does it. Kind of gives you a little understanding of kind of what's going to go on, but not every little, you know, itsy bitsy little detail. Like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty broad statement. But you know what? We, we don't need to know uh, every little detail. And quite frankly, we couldn't understand if he told us. And so, anyway, let's move along. I don't want to camp out too long because there's a lot to cover. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, you're going to see where this is kind of a little bit of talking, either this is... Uh, prior to the tribulation or after the tribulation. Well, the point being, in the end times, there's going to be troubles. Troubles like this earth has never seen. And our job as Christians, followers of Christ, is to be ready. So whatever happens, we're ready. For whatever God decides to do with us, whoop, we're ready. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places, or in many places. In this last um, probably 10 years, we've seen a lot of uh, things, uh, uh, natural disasters, which uh, we really have not seen in this generation. Tornadoes hitting the United States. Um, Katrina, uh, a few years back, uh, where there was uh, great uh, uh, water flooding into the New Orleans and southern coast areas here in our country. Uh, we watched uh, Haiti uh, get hammered. Uh, uh, we watched uh, things go on in South America. We've seen the Indo Indochina, Indonesia region hit with tsunamis. Uh, we've seen this thing in Japan This happened with this uh, earthquake in the ocean caused huge tidal waves to hit Japan and they had the nuclear problems there. So we've, we've experienced some things um, that really we really haven't experienced. And this is the time for man to wake up and thinking, hmm, maybe God is trying to speak to us. And quite frankly, friend, um, God does bring judgment and sometimes it seems cruel, and it's, it's uh, you know, a long time in coming. This, this earth uh, has, for the most part, rejected the one true God, turned to many, many false religions, and, uh, and it's getting close to that time where God is going to wrap it up and start to deal with this earth uh, in judgment, in fire, and uh, it's coming. So, could be tomorrow, could be 10 years from now, could be 100 years from now. But the point being is, be ready. Be ready in Christ. Be free in Christ. Be honest with Him. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Thou shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. When calamity happens, it is the natural human instinct to start blaming somebody. It's the government. It's you guys. Um, uh, if you have a, a marriage and uh, something traumatic happens in the broad family, say they immediately it seems like you want to blame somebody. Blame. It's because of, but you know what? Just troubles come. There's really nobody to blame. It's just troubles come. And all you can really do is 
submit to God. And during this time, uh, many will turn on one another, um, maybe for favors, for money, so forth. Um, but the, the point for Christians is to stay true to the end. And if you aren't ready, uh, when Christ comes and snatches away the body of Christ, his people, up into the heavens, um, and you're left behind, uh, you realize that you have one last chance, one last chance. Stay true to the Lord, and it will be to the death uh, for you. And, uh, but you will have that one last chance if you should make it, if you should survive, um, and it will be uh, probably to the death. And so, very tough times that will be uh, spread upon the earth. And uh, I sure don't want to be here. And uh, I don't think you do either, friend. And so, be ready for Jesus Christ. If you got sins, repent of them. Just say, that's enough. I'm sorry, God. Yes, I'm responsible. I did them. Forgive me. And come into my heart and help me to obey you better and to be your child. It's very simple, folks. Uh, people call it the born-again experience. Some people become like like children, becoming like children again, uh, becoming part of the way of, of Jesus Christ, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, it's about knowing the truth, your creator, Jesus Christ. Uh, he created you for his pleasure. Uh, and so when we turn and put, give back to him what he gave to us, which is life, and give back to him the worship and obedience and adoration that he so deserves, you will find that has eternal ramifications that are gloriously uh, enthralled in the heavens for us. And so, anyway, let's get move along. Get moving along here. Um, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Um, we're about to go into the abomination of desolation, but it is very interesting in this day and age. You know, it's good and bad. You got the internet, you got cell phones, I got the internet, the web, um, the televisions uh, are, are everywhere you go. You know, they're, if, if you haven't been brainwashed, they're trying to desperately to get you sucked into the rat race of spending money and and uh, immoral ecstasies and, uh, you know, just the whole uh, the media sh being shoved down your throat. Everywhere you go, you go to the, you go to the uh, gym to work out. They have televisions on the bicycles. You go to the doctor's office. They got a television blaring at you. You know, you go to the airports. They got the television blaring. Everywhere you go, it's blaring at you. The billboards, the radio, pumping this worldly message. But somewhere, somehow, the message of Jesus Christ is lost. But all this fantastic stuff is going on and people are just so distracted, they lose sight in their own salvation. So the whole world's going to know. I mean, there are preachers out there. Hopefully some of you can hear the message of Christ through all of these uh, Bible teachings, uh, maybe in the, even in the bodybuilding sessions where we have a little Bible, we share a little bit of the Word with you, and uh, uh, maybe you can uh, open up your heart and your mind and realize Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, the media is there, you know, so you got to hunt for it, but there is some good media there, and the Bible says the whole world's going to know, and so the world definitely. Uh, you know, has the ability to hear, uh, but for the most part, you know, if it's about listening to a guy talking about the Bible, it's kind of boring, or watching a football game, or dancing girls, or a rock concert, you know, generally, you know, they're going to switch, switch off Bible study and move over to something a little more exciting. It's just the way it is. Okay, let's get focused again here. I'm getting a little off track. Uh, verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, 
Whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, now there's becomes, in this little section here, this is very Jewish. Because you know what? I don't live in Judea. Fleeing to the mountains of Judea will do me no good. Okay, so there is this next little section is for those that are in Israel, realizing the beast somehow is going to move into that little region, try to gain control, uh, both politically, monetarily, spiritually, uh, economically, somehow, some way, he's going to take control using that little uh, Middle Eastern region there. Okay, verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field turn back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So you understand here that has a real Jewish flavor. And for those that are Jews, be it Christian or non-Christian, those that are Jews in that region, this is for them. Because you know what? I'm not going to flee to the mountains of Judea. That's, that's thousands of miles where I'm at, and that will do me no good. The Sabbath day in the United States, for the most part, they really is not observed. I try and observe a Sunday Sabbath rest. Um because it is the first day of the week, and uh, New Testament Christians met on the first day of the week. Um, it's kind of just kind of our habit. But as far as being a Sabbath day where the transport, t transport uh, buses and, and gas stations and so forth, they're, they're not closed up on the Sabbath day. It, it's almost meaningless in the United States. They, it's really not hardly honored at all. You know, a lot of factories work on Sunday just and Saturday and Sunday, just like it's a Monday or Tuesday. You know, maybe it's a little bit lighter staff, but they just keep on cranking away and making money. And so this really is uh, for Israel. This is for Jews living in Israel at this time. For then there shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Understand here, this is for Israel. Um, this uh, time period of judgment um, for predominantly Israel, uh, Jews, will probably, uh, if you re refer and relate and compare some of this, Scripture to some of the passages in First and Second Thessalonians, um, and the Book of Jude, uh, and Second uh, Peter, uh, where you where it kind of deals just a little bit, kind of touches on this just a little bit, and um, it's very much so that this is dealing with Israelites, Jews that somehow were under this. Uh, this false religious, uh, uh, you know, the Kabbalah and, the, you know, just uh, science will set us free and all that kind of garbage. You know, Jews and the Israel, Israel people living in that region are very much sucked into that. And for the most part, they rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But during this time, the Bible seems to indicate there will be a great revival of the Jewish people of turning to Jesus Christ because... Somehow when the beast kind of sets himself up there, you know, um, you know, the church seems to be gone. Uh, the restraining one that restrains is kind of taken out of the way, probably taken out of the way when the church has gone off of the earth. Um, then the beast kind of is empowered. And uh, Israel kind of sees uh, this beast uh, as being a, a, a savior for a while. And, but when he sets himself up in the temple of God, as being God, Jews are going to understand they swallowed the great lie. And many 
Jews, Israelites, will come to Jesus Christ during that time. There will be a great revival. But it will be a very difficult time. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So, here we have a little section of scripture where I believe we're, we're, we're popping before and after the tribulation period where there'll be a, a vast number of false prophets. Um, uh, dealing with false prophets is a touchy issue because we live in a time where we don't want to offend anybody. You know, you don't dare, dare say uh, God is against homosexuals. You know, oh, no, that's, you know, they want to say, oh, no, they can be pastors and ministers and get married. They're, they're calling evil good. You know, we're, we're living in that day and age where if you say homosexual, uh, homosexuality is a sin, and it is a sin, but we live in a day and age where if you say it's a sin, they'll accuse you of a hate crime. All right? And um, so then we got all the false religions. We got Buddhism. We got Islam, Shintoism, Hindus. Um, the, we got the Way Internationals. We got the Jehovah's, the Mormons. Um, you know, all various uh, plagiarized Catholicism type uh, pseudo Christianities. But there was a lot of false prophets around, friend. Lots. There was a lot when I was a kid. There's that many and more now. And uh, people are easily deceived, easily fooled. Um, and uh, the Bible just says, be warned. Be aware. They're going to be out there. Pay close attention to God's word. Cling to it tightly. No matter what people say, Cling tightly to his word. And some things may not be totally understandable to you, you know, immediately. Eventually, as you study more and more, you'll understand more and more. But we're not going to understand everything. It's just too vast. It's just too vast. The point is, don't be deceived by the false prophets. Check it out in the word for yourself. Okay, here we go. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if thou shalt say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For whosoever, for wheresoever the carcass is, or wherever, whoever's carcass it is, there will the eagles be gathered together. There is two huge uh, interpretations to this uh, passage. Uh, number one, God's not going to say, come out to this island and you'll find the Messiah, or come to Mexico, or Puerto Rico, or New York City, or Israel. Or You're not going to need to rush off to these places to find the secret manifestation of the of you know, some woman, you know, that's coming in the clouds and, and, you know, and the cloud shimmers. You don't need to run off to them. God will be with you. He is near you in your, in your mouth and in your heart if you so confess him. He will be with you. You don't need to run off to, the, to these weird places to try and find the secret, uh, this manifestation that happens, you know, every day at noon or whatever. You don't need to do that. So said, God said, don't be fooled by the false prophets. And so, likewise, as a lightning cometh out of the east and shineth to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Very clear, quick, and definite. And then it talks about wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. Now, you can say, some people believe that this is talking about for wherever the carcass is there, that eagles shall be gathered together. And some translations say, wherever the body is, there the eagle will be gathered. Other translations say, wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered. Uh, in either case, there is a huge gathering together um, 
of carrion or eagles because there's a uh, either that's representative or of a large number of people or it's representative for a huge, huge battle where the vultures come and they got a lot of meat to eat, if you know what I mean. Um, and some people think, well, this is the body of Christ because, you know, lightning has come and, whew, you know, all of a sudden. Uh, in either case, the translation could go either way, depending on whether it's an eagle. And, you know, there's various things about, you know, we'll rise up with eagle's wings and fly and, and so forth. Um, but if this interpretation is, as some uh, translations have it, the uh, vultures or the... Um, the carnivores, um, where the carcasses have gathered, that gives you a whole different translation of perhaps this is where a bunch of bodies, the evil, have been taken away um, into this great valley to be destroyed. In either case, something great's going to happen, and we have no control about it. Okay, all we can do is be ready. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Well, it is very interesting. Um, the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens. A lot of people think, well, there you go. That's when the rapture happens after the tribulation. All right. Um, But see, this is a time after the tribulation where God comes physically and touches down upon the earth. And it says, The Son of Man shall appear in heaven, and the tribes of the earth will mourn. So they see the great Messiah coming. The judging of the earth is just about completed for that time. And they will mourn. Because the true Messiah is coming and they rejected him. And then it says, He shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. In uh, Thessalonians, the second chapter of uh, Thessalonians, and in the first, uh, first Thessalonians, um, it says that the Lord will bring with him those who have already died. And there are also sections of the scripture where it says Christ will bring the armies in the heavens, and that would be us coming with him to rule and to reign upon the earth back to the earth. And then it says, you will gather together his elect from the four winds. Yes, the, the saints will be spread throughout all of the heavens and the earth and will be gathered together uh, unto him, wherever we may be at that point in time. Um, but the rapture of the church has already happened. But we are coming together, we're being joined back together to come and join with him to set up a, his reigning kingdom upon the earth for a thousand years. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So friend, we're going to see great things happen. Once we start seeing this rapid uh, uh, acceleration of, of uh, natural disasters, wars, 
When we start seeing all that, there's a real good chance we're going to see all, to the, all of this come to play uh, into the tribulation, uh, uh, was, which is going to take place after the church is gone. And, uh, but that's going to all start to ascend at a really uh, rapid pace as God uh, kind of makes this uh, set forth in his timing. Uh, and it will happen quickly. It says this generation will not pass away. And a generation is, you know, you know, what does a generation live? 70, 80, 90 years? Okay, so, you know, kind of like the World War I generation that what we've seen, you know, there's a few around, but uh, not many. You know, right? There's a few, not many. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. There is a distinction between the Father and the Son. And yet, biblically, they're referred to as one. God the Father is all supreme. He is almighty God. He is spirit, most holy and righteous. God the Son is also God. They are individual, but they are one. Very good representation of that is a husband and wife. A uh, man marries a woman. The Bible says they've become one. We're two people, but my wife, we are one together. When she hurts, you know, I feel sorry for her. When she's in, uh, uh, dur you know, duress, you know, with troubles or problems, that kind of brings me down because I am one with her, but we're two different people. And that's very similar, N not exactly, but very similar to how God is one, and yet there's a Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Well, there, once again, there's broad interpretations of where this is. Keep in mind, we have no control of this. Okay, So you've got to be careful not to go too far off on a limb of, well, this is this and this is that. I understand there's very good men have very firm beliefs on, on what these are. And I'll give you my opinion. Um, but like I said, really God's in control of this, so why should we sweat it? Um, two people are taken, one, one in one part of the world, another in another part of the world, in two different situations, two different sets of peoples, one out of each of the set is taken. Are they taken away for good? Are they part of this where God says, gather up the elect? Or is it one out of each of these pairs taken to be judged, where it says the Lord will separate the tares from the wheat and bind them in bundles for a judgment in the, in the fires of hell. Not really sure. Um, depending on which emphasis that you really uh, presume to take here. Um, in either case, uh, we're not in control of that. And uh, that's, I'm not going to push it any farther than that. Um, my opinion, um, you have, it says that uh, these... Uh, angels have come to gather the elect. Uh, then it kind of goes up before and back of uh, what's happening in the end times. Um, two grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. Um, uh, 
Then we got uh, two in the field, one shall be taken and another left. Um, you know, they're doing basically normal things. Uh, one is taken and the other is left. Um, generally speaking, kind of being left behind was not a good thing. Generally speaking, kind of like, you know, uh, the Narnia tale where they got the little beaver animal. And uh, they would say, well, is that a good, a good thing or a bad thing? And, and uh, one of them said, I forget which one, but he says, well, generally the beavers are the good guys. And they kind of went with that. It's like, yeah, that's true. Well, in this case, generally being left behind really is not a good thing. And so I would have a tendency to, to go with a point of these kind of being uh, caught away for a good thing, in, in my opinion. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not the ultimate in church uh, doctrine and philosophy and theology and so forth. Um, but that's my opinion. Generally, being left behind is not a good thing. So I'll we'll leave it at that. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour ye think not the Son of Man cometh. That is the point of this whole chapter, folks. If you remember nothing else, remember that. Be ready for Jesus Christ. Don't be caught in sin. Just give it up now. Just give it up. Give it up. Throw it to the wind. Say enough, enough, enough. Okay? Women, with your issues and whatever, with deals with your husband, enough, say enough. With your husbands, single men, you're often something that you know you shouldn't be into, you feel guilty about it, I say enough, enough. I repent, God forgive me. Let it go, let it fly away, enough. Be ready, be ready for Jesus Christ. Who then is the faithful and wise servant when his Lord hath made him ruler over his household to give them meat and due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I send, say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come on a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. So surprise, surprise. Be on your toes, folks. Be on your toes. Anyway, and he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. This wasn't just a little parable. This was the truth. That person's going to be assigned a place with the hypocrites because he was not ready. Kind of like that parable of the ten virgins. Okay? Some were taken and some were left. So keep in mind, the ones left behind it wasn't a good thing. And the ones taken away, they entered into the feast. So folks, with that, God bless you. Read your Bible today. Read your Bible tomorrow. Read it all week. If you got sin, repent of it. Be done with it. God bless you, folks. Talk to you later from the Bears Gym. See you, folks.